Good afternoon. Thanks all and thanks to Jessica for inviting me to this uh, talk. So briefly I would like to introduce myself and let you know uh, what we do. I'm Maria Chiara from PIM Studio Architects and who we are. It's, we are two directors at PIM Studio. We are both Italians and uh, where we come from, as I said, like we where um, uh, we met in Milan, we studied in Milan and then moved to Lisbon to study in New York as well for our studies. Finally, we started working and then uh, we chose the Netherlands for as our first, uh, let's say, job. And uh, I was working in OMA uh, on big master plans and small projects at the same time. Then we moved to Tokyo to join Kengo Kuma and Associates. Uh, with him, we've been traveling and working uh, a bit uh, everywhere, back in Europe and in uh, Asia. So we moved to Edinburgh, then Paris, then finally London, where we actually uh, open our office. Uh, it's PIM Studio and we're based here. <laughs> in Old Street, close to Old Street. And what we do is projects are very different scales. So uh, we started from the VNA at Dundee where we, were, where we won the competition back in Japan. We followed through uh, up to construction. Finally, last year, now is one year that the building is open. So we enjoy very much working on this building and doing some interior design competition. We do like a very small, very, very small buildings as well, as well as temporary exhibition. But I'm here to talk about a research that we start when we open our offices about rewilding architecture. So what is rewilding architecture? Actually, rewilding is about reintegrate uh, wildlife and wild lands where species have disappeared and restoring natural ecosystem with a less human-centric approach. So we've been start asking ourselves, what does it mean for architecture to be wild, let's say, to be rewilded? And we know the architecture when, since the very beginning, the, means, the meaning of architecture is to protect human, to separate human from the natural environment in order to give and uh, to protect, let's say, the environment. And they have a, architecture itself has a very strong anthropocentric uh, view. And in the centuries, in my opinion, has driven away uh, humans from the natural environment because we are trying to kind of control our own environment and control the space where we live. But then sometimes, sometimes actually, um, uh, let's say people live and then nature comes back and uh, takes control of what has been left. So, and then we find like spaces that are completely surreal, that are like um, extremely powerful in my opinion. So like uh, we have, this is in Bangkok, is a, let's say, is a mall, shopping mall, uh, where nature uh, take, took, priority. So uh, in my opinion, in our opinion at PIM Studio, we should stop thinking about the world as a separation, like as a kind of separated between the uh, man and nature. Because uh, at the end of the day, this is of course man-made. We build our cities. Even when we are low density, we still build and design our environment. And even when we uh, think and we draw actually completely natural places that we think about natural places, they are still man-made. Even though when they produce amazing wine, they're still man-made. So landscape is actually part of this, uh, let's say, approach. And in my opinion, we should find a more, much more meaningful integration between uh, what is human, what is architecture, and what is actually natural. So, happens sometimes that nature actually comes and visits, and these visits are really creating a very surreal uh, space and sensation for us that we look at this picture, like uh, is extremely, um, I think, uh, unsettling for an architect to see these, those images. But then, of course, like, people are working on uh, uh, kind of planning, planning uh, how we can uh, reintroduce wildness into our cities. For example, like this, this project is called Wild West End in London that is working in the 
West End, of course, and trying to reintroduce wildness into our cities, like uh, on rooftops, at the ground floor as well. But then we ended up again with this kind of situation where you see, like, trying the to trying to recover the wildness, but then, like, having like pieces of architecture that actually are the leftover of the architecture, or, like the services, or, like, is not really an integration. It's always something that is like kind of add-ons at the end, like uh, in a way, okay, we can re, we try to re-establish a, a balance, but it's not really a balance. In the past, actually, architecture was like very direct, was responding to what the need of, uh, let's say, the humans. In this case, is a, a monastery in Portugal that had like a huge uh, kitchen, and in the kitchens you had the river that was actually uh, going through the um, monastery and bringing fresh fish into the kitchen together with the river. So actually, like, meaningful integration between architecture and nature are possible. Of course, in this case, it's still like in the service of the community of the monks. But then you start, you, start, you start thinking how architecture is shaped in order to welcome this river that comes into the building itself. And then there are like much stronger uh, architecture uh, buildings that are designed to integrate. For example, this is the Tower of Silence, and uh, those are like, um, they were built by Perseus. Uh, they built the tower, um, tower of Silence in stone at the entrance of the cities, where they exposed the, the dead bodies and to the birds in order to kind of restart the cycle of life. So it is an architecture that is taught to give, to have a space where integration between human and uh, animals uh, become possible. I would like to show also like this project that is a house in uh, Japan. Um, it's built, let's say, in the woodlands. And this house is like, to me, very, very special. When I was in Japan, I, I learned a lot how to have a different approach, let's say, to design. This house is a house and just by the means of covering a piece of land with a roof. So what this means, it means that you create a space that is really a collaboration be between a natural element that is the soil. This house was just like kind of gently um, uh, put on top of this land and the soil is exposed. So this is a space that is in between something that is, uh, let's say, man-made and something that is completely natural. So the feeling that you have when you are in one of these spaces, I think, is like, extremely powerful and, in my opinion, is where we should look at it. Again, like, this is Andrea Branzi and in, in his project we see how he wanted to share natural materials, like raw natural materials, with man-made materials. And they collaborate in order to give the possibility to the people to sit. So what's like, it's like so powerful, the, really, that by through the integration of this handle, you are able actually to pull the tea and to not get burned. So it is not a fight in between, let's say, the two elements, but is actually a kind of coming together. So what also we want to propose and we want to think about architecture as a space to collaborate, a space to collaborate across species. That's what is, my opinion, my opinion very important, like to really what means uh, have a multi-species architecture. So it's architecture that is a kind of going, is like trans-species. Um, so what we do in our project, like I will go very quickly, is not like, uh, those are just experiments. Uh, we are, like a very young office, we, our office is just two years old, and uh, so. But like, what we try to explain, for example, this is a, um, a space for um, let's say local band, and they want they wanted to have a space in the mountain. I mean, the village is in the mountain, and they wanted to have a, like a local. Uh, as uh, whole, and we wanted to propose, uh, uh, again, like using this approach of integration, how we can use the landscape, how we can use the mountain to integrate our space and our philharmonic. So then you can see from inside, you are part of the landscape, but especially the green roof is the key of our design in this case, where we, together with nature, are able to give 
let's say, to give the space, the possibility to, uh, for the music hall to be, let's say, under the cover of this uh, roof. And the roof is part of, I mean, it's alive. The roof itself is, let's say, full of animals, full of like uh, wildflowers, local, uh, uh, let's say, meat. And this is nothing new. I mean, we've seen this in, uh, let's say, traditional architecture all the time. In this roof, you will have like thousands of species actually living and protecting the house that you have from the uh, cold or from the, too, from the harsh weather outside. So it's actually like, a, it's always regenerating, it's always changing with the seasons and with the colors. And again, like we can learn how in vernacular architecture, actually we see a powerful integration between, the different, between human design and other species. This is a traditional uh, Japanese house, as I was saying, like uh, I, um, I moved to Japan and I was living there and I like, uh, learned uh, a lot about like, their approach of, uh, let's say, design and nature, how architecture actually integrates in a spatial way. Like this is a very traditional let's say, section, but you can, all, you can already see the house is lifted from the ground. It's like much more light and doesn't, let's say, obstruct it. Uh, the power, let's say, the water uh, entering the ground, the uh, uh, animals traveling through the house, and especially like the distance, the openness and closeness between inside and outside always changing. And the space in between is so important. Like all the spaces that you can open and close are a kind of a series of like proper, meaningful spaces. And then we try to do uh, to take a similar approach of a, this is a house again we are drawing we are uh, designing in uh, Geneva, and uh, we try to uh, let's say apply some of the pro of the concept that we learned. So uh, we've been like lifting the house where it's possible uh, out uh, let's say the soil. We introduce a patio in the center of the house. So at the end of the day, is the house that is in between the nature because we try to include nature at every. Uh, place like uh, we there is a patio in the center as I was saying and then here is the vision of the section of our house where we have the pool a natural pool where you can swim with uh, uh, wild fishes and then this kind of enclose uh, more protected nature uh, for the um, for the patio and finally the kind of green roof and we extend the roof as much as possible in order to give the possibility to have as many interstitial space as possible in order to welcome um, wildlife, especially birds and like, small uh, insects, uh, as you can see in the zoom in. And, um. So there is a um, biologist, he's called Dan... Uh, Brown is very interesting what he writes and uh, again uh, I've learned uh, a lot about his book that is called Never Home Alone and this book in my opinion show us how we can truly thrive in our house just if we are able to welcome all the unknown guests that have been there the whole time. Basically, our house is already full of animals, it's already alive, and even if we don't see it, we have species everywhere in every uh, moment. So then we need to, in my opinion, enjoy, like the couple that is like, uh, enjoying their wine surrounded by in their house surrounded by the animals. And with, following this approach, we actually wanted to design this um, visitor center for uh, for seven hawks, and uh, we wanted to create an harmony with the nature, integrating nature, actually building a, a let's say visitor center that is for the visitor, but is mainly the house of the animals of the place, the animals of the uh, let's say natural reserve. So we again lift the house, lift the building, and have a design. Um, Facade that is actually a space and it is as more porous as possible in order to integrate flora and fauna uh, in, within the architecture. So the architecture is first for the animals and for the nature. And it's again nothing new. I mean, it's something that has been there all the time in uh, how we, uh, insects and small birds can inhabit our architecture. If we give them the chance to do it, if we, in our design we allow for other species to. Uh, let's say, occupy those spaces. 
And uh, so we, again, another test, we try to inhabit it, or like we try to offer spaces to uh, the butterflies. This is a small pavilion for the center of London in St. Paul. And we wanted to, let's say, have a hunting garden for the butterfly to kind of occupy St. Paul um, gardens. And then finally, again, master plan where the green is what keeps the master plan together and what integrates all the buildings because like uh, the buildings are different as well as the city, like uh, every building is completely different, but how we can bring them together is kind of creating a new way of living that is like much more welcoming of other species. And architecture should be designed, in my opinion, to kind of envisage this and try to uh, include other species. As much as possible, design of a square. In Italy, uh, we propose, this is like a completely, um, let's say, voluntary proposal that we uh, offer to the city. Uh, it's a small city in the center of Italy, and we propose to cover the Duomo Square uh, with trees in order to, uh, let's say, give more uh, space for uh, the people to enjoy during the hot summer, but as well to kind of bring in animals. They were part of the city since not so long time ago. It's maybe like we pushed animals outside of the city since maybe 50 years, no more. So it's like easy to think about like these spaces to be absolutely real and possible, in my opinion. Finally, we wanted to rewire the RIBA as well. So we proposed like a, a small garden inside of the architecture um, gallery at the RIBA. So in order to kind of again switch the Kind of the usual understanding of inside and outside spaces, so how we can find uh, nature and a garden within a gallery space. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>